as some of you might know that I recently had to clear my computer, delete a bunch of stuff because it was compromised. And so in having to reinstall all my software and stuff, one of the things that I need to reinstall is my VirtualBox. So what is VirtualBox? VirtualBox is a piece of software that you can run on Linux, Windows, or Mac, and it allows you to create a virtual machine in which you can run other operating systems. So there's a lot there that I've just said, and without the picture, you're probably lost. So let's see if I can illustrate this for you. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So we're gonna compare what is the host OS versus the guest OS to try and understand what's going on with something like VirtualBox. So let's say I have a desktop or a laptop computer, physical computer. I install a operating system. So this might be Mac, Linux, or Windows, or whatever, right? Um, Solaris, it doesn't matter, just some operating system on that piece of supported hardware. So my desktop slash laptop computer there in blue, that is the physical hardware. That's the thing that you can walk, touch, pick up, feel, kick around, please don't, but you get the idea, physical. And then I install the software to run on that computer. Now, once I do this, now I can install multiple application in my operating system, right? So VirtualBox would be an application. VS Code is an application. Um, your browser, Word, whatever, game or something, those are all application in white. And I could have multiple application running within this operating system that I have installed on this physical computer. VirtualBox, however, is a special piece of software. It is an application, but it's a special piece of application. And what it does is it allows you to create, think of it like a document almost, that describe a virtual machine. So it allows you to create this file, essentially, that describes a virtual machine. So since it's describing a virtual machine, within that virtual machine, assuming that oh, not only can it describe a virtual machine, but it can trick the software, the same software that you would run on your physical machine, which is the Bloom is your physical machine, and that sort of brung there is a software, you can take that same software and run it within on this virtual machine. Now I put the, the guest OS in green to differentiate the guest OS from the host OS, right? So the host OS is in the brung, that could be Mac, Linux, or whatever is supported on your physical hardware. And then VirtualBox, because it's creating a virtual machine, you can then have a guest OS that is some one of the supported um, operating system, right? And so once you have installed an OS, a guest OS in this virtual machine, now you can install apps, multiple apps in blue on those, on this guest OS, on this guest OS. And so you can see how crazy this is like, um, you know, those Russian doll, a doll within a doll within a doll. That's sort of what's going on here, right? And so this allows us now to isolate and test things. Like if you, one of your application there in blue, you're worried about its security or something, then you create a virtual machine, install the required operating system, install the application within that virtual environment. It wouldn't mess up with your OS operating system. And so that's what we're going to do. And so you can create multiple VMs. You depend on the resources you have on your computer, as we'll see later, whether it's CPU or RAM, um, those are two things you're really gonna need, and some hard drive space. Um, you can run these virtual machine in parallel. Well, we're going to say parallel, but there's an asterisk there, okay? Assuming that you have multiple cores and all this other stuff, yes, it's gonna, you can run them in parallel. But otherwise, you can run multiple of these, just like how you'd run multiple application on your computer. You can have these different VMs running, and you can access them and use them, right? There are different ways to use them. Because it's running on your computer, you can have the physical screen show up there. And these can be GUI application, you know, like... Since you put now Windows, well, then the application is running within Windows and Mac and Linux. There are GUI, they have GUI desktops too, right? Graphical interfaces. When I say GUI, graphical interfaces. So GUI means graphical user interface. Now we know that though your physical computer has an Ethernet interface. When I say Ethernet interface, I don't care if it's a physical Ethernet interface like RJ45 or Wi-Fi, but it's something that allows you to do networking. And with that, you can connect to your network. And you have, you have internet access or con connect to other computer within your home network and so on, right? Usually you refer to a LAN, local area network. But however that is, we know that your physical computer can make connection to other computers and computing devices within whatever environment you operate in. Well, guess what? This virtual machine or VM, you'll, you'll see people sometimes say VM. 
these VM have a virtual interface also, uh, virtual network interfaces, interface, and they could have multiple too, and they also make connection to your physical computer using your physical computer interface. And you don't have to worry about this. Virtual back and your OS know how to do all this stuff so that's how they can connect. And there are a number of ways in which you can make your VM accessible to your network and your network accessible to those VMs. So you can imagine there's a computing device out on your network that might want to talk to that Linux box that you're running as a, on a virtual machine, and that is possible. And we're not going to spend time here really looking at all the different ways. We're just going to say it how it's possible. And so I want you to just sort of visualize this. Okay, so that's it. Let's get back to some of the installation and why we might want to do this. So hopefully it's clear why you might actually want to do this. Like I said, the isolation and security, plus the ability that if you're using one operating system, like my OS operating system is a Mac OS, but I want to use Linux or something, then using something like VirtualBox totally makes sense that way I don't have to go actually get another physical machine that runs Linux. So let's jump to the VirtualBox website. And you can see here, it talks about VirtualBox is a powerful virtualization project, product, blah, 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 and goes on and on. Um, you don't have to worry about that. All you need to do is click on the download button. Now there's a big green download button here. You cannot miss it. But just in case, you can click on downloads on the left right um, side here in the left menu, and you can see it works on Windows, OS, Linux, and some other, um, and Solaris. So we're gonna download for um, OS X, um, which is a Mac, and you can see that start downloading. I've already downloaded it, so I'll just cancel that. And uh, let's do, doo -doo -doo, maybe I'll do show in, um, well, actually, I'm not gonna worry about showing that. Um, do ls minus lrt and my download directory and so I'm looking for virtual box and so there it is and so what I'll do is open and let me highlight this and so I'll say open that and that's going to that's all I on Mac you you know you can double click it and Windows and Linux the same thing on Mac I can type this open command I think it works also on Linux but essentially is think of me double clicking um, this file and whatever the process is for your operating system, you don't have to worry too much. Just simply double click and start and accept the defaults and step through it. And so that's what I'm gonna do here. Um, let me have to give Grant some permission here. Um, that is weird. So let me go down here and click this and privacy, um, there we go. And um, it wants to allow full disk aspects to something. Um, let me see, um, da -da -da. Wait, wait, actually, what did it even say? Uh, the installation fail, what? Let's see, close, um, keep, let me see. Maybe it did install correctly. Um, virtual box. Okay, so it looks like it installed correctly, but it needs some permission. Oh, yep, it installed correctly. Even though it said it failed, is because I didn't get to grant that permission. It gave me option to allow something. I click on it, and what was supposed to happen was it supposed to open this um, security and privacy um, preference window here and allow me to select the privacy or um, the permission that it needs. So I'm guessing it needs full disk access. So if I scroll down here, let me see if virtual box is in the list. It's not there. Files and folders. Let me see if it's in the list here. Um, not in the list. Okay. So what kind of information? It doesn't need screen recording. Um, input monitoring. Um, nope. Uh, speech. No microphone. It shouldn't need that. Camera. It shouldn't need that. So I'm not exactly sure what um, it needs permission to. And so um, maybe when I try running it again, it's going to um, ask what it needs permission to. So I'll leave that open. But notice I've started VirtualBox. And there's a plugin, um, essentially, that VirtualBox need. Um, I think they call it a something pack, extension pack. And basically, what that extension pack is, it's cross-platform, but it um, helps VirtualBox better able to integrate with your platform in terms of providing screen resolution and all this other stuff. 
So to install the VirtualBox um, virtual extension pack, go to Preferences, I believe, and then uh, Extensions. And then you can click on this plus button. And usually, you have to download it. Oh, so VirtualBox would like to access files in your Documents folder. OK. And then um, these are some of the downloads I have. VirtualBox would like to access file in your download folder. OK. All right, fine. And usually, you would have to download it first and then select it from this directory. But since I don't have it downloaded yet, um, what I can do is go to the downloads page again. There it is. And I scroll down to extension pack. And you see all supported platform. And I click this. It's going to download. It's already downloaded. So I go back. Where is that VirtualBox window? There it is. And I select extension pack. Um, come on. There we go. Select it. Open. And it installs. You're going to ask me if you want permission. It asks me to read some stuff. Scroll along the bottom, agree, and then here. All right, and so it should install. Now, um, from time to time, your virtual box is going to need up, well, it's going to update, and you might need a new extension pack. Fortunately, um, when it VirtualBox detects that it needs a new extension pack, it's just going to prompt you to download, and it's going to download it, and you don't have to go to the website to download it. Previously, you had to go and download it. It would tell you it needs one, and then you had to go download it. Now, they integrated, so it's much better. So now we're all set up. I mean, like I said, the extension pack, it really, it would still work without the extension pack. It's just the extension pack allows VirtualBox to integrate much better with your operating system. So now we're ready to install an operating system. So which operating system should we install? So here I am on the Ubuntu website. It's just ubuntu.com. And you can click on the download button here. And it would take you to either download and install Ubuntu desktop, which is the graphical interface and so on. So it's give your environment similar to my Mac here or Windows. So you can you know use a GUI and all this other stuff, web browser and so on. Or if you want to do server, and this is if you want to run a server regardless whether it has head or headless. Now, if, when I say head or headless, it means I have a monitor and a, key, um, a monitor and keyboard attached. But sometimes you run a server, like I run several Ubuntu um, Linux servers, and they do not have a monitor and keyboard permanently attached. Only when I want to install or do something that I can't do remotely, then I connect a monitor. Other than that, I just log in remotely and do updates and everything else. Once I finish installing the operating system, I just remove the monitor and keyboard because I don't need it. All right, so let's call it headless. So this is how I'm going to be running um, this Linux um, on my in, in VM is that I'm going to be running it in a virtual machine, but I'm going to have it connect to my network. And I can still access it like if it's a physical machine somewhere on my network, even though it's running on my computer as a guest. And the different networking option, I'm just going to show you that, that way, which is the easiest one when you do bridge networking. Bridge networking just simply means that oh, you bridge the virtual machine to your actual network through the Ethernet interface that is on your physical machine and your whatever is the out network um, IP addresses, their DHCP server on your network, just sees that virtual machine like any other machine. It does not know it's a virtual machine. It just sees a client come up and say, I want an IP address, and it gives it an IP address. So a lot of information here if you don't know anything about networking and so on. But um, so let's go with Ubuntu server. Um, like I say, you can do desktop, and you could create multiple VMs. So if you, I'm going to show you how to do Ubuntu server, definitely try desktop if you like. Now, what's the difference between LTS and like 910? Well, Ubuntu, the way to do it is they give the year and the month when they release. And so they have their six months release. So they're going to have like a 19.04, 19.10, and then it's going to be a 20.04, and then a 20.10, blah, blah, blah. The LTS stands for long term, long -term support. And so long term support of, um, edition usually um, are supported, I think, for maybe five to eight years, something. I can't remember the exact number. Whereas um, these non-LTS one, they only get support for maybe a, a year or two, maybe two years, not a year, maybe two years. But long term just simply means yeah, much longer than the other one. So it doesn't really matter for us. I'm going to delete this VM at some point within the next six months and reinstall it anyway. But let's just go with LTS, right? And so um, it's going to start downloading. And you can see it downloading there. And I already have it download. So again, I'm going to cancel but you would let it download um, in your environment. Micro KS here is something we're going to eventually try when we get into our 
microservices sort of stuff, by the way. Uh, micro KS in K8 and K3S is another one we're gonna be, um, we're gonna be playing around with, but we're we're sort of not there yet, so we'll ignore that. Um, so now that should finish downloading, I can go back here, and now I need to create a new VM. So I can click New for create a new VM. I can do add to add an existing VM um, that I have in a directory somewhere. I can Im ex import a VM that somebody has exported. And so you can see I can have a VM, I can export it, send it to somewhere else or send it to someone else and import it back or put it, move it to another machine. So there's a number of cool things you can do with a virtual machine. So when you have a VM, so I'll click new and here I'm going to call this Ubuntu um, 18, you know, 18.04 LTS and you can give it any name you, you like. This is where it's going to store it in this directory, um, the supporting files. And this is the type of operating system you want to install. It's not entirely, it's not, it just sort of doesn't matter. All this does is do some pre-configuration of the environment, the VM based on the type of operating system. As you can see, like I said, these are all the other guest operating systems you can install, Windows, Linux, Solaris, BSD, IBM, Mac OS X, or you could just say other, and basically you just get to conf configure. If, um, you always get to configure everything, it's just that the, the, it takes the most basic and it doesn't make any assumption about the type of operating system. So I'll choose Linux here, and it wants to know if it's 64-bit because it's simulating a machine, right? A physical PC. So it wants to know whether it should simulate a 32-bit or a 64-bit um, system. So I'll put 64-bit here. And notice how for Linux, it has all these different Linux um, distribution or just other if you are doing something that's not in this list. Like for example, one of the Linux distribution I will try, I will be playing with in a future video is Deeping. And Deeping is not in this list. So I will just simply do other 64-bit or maybe Debian 64 because I believe Deepin is based off of Debian anyway. Um, similarly, Ubuntu is actually based off of Debian, but they're here as separate um, distribution. But let's just continue. This really just affects the architecture. And then you click continue. And notice how much RAM do you want to allocate to this virtual machine? If you remember, if you think about it, you're creating a virtual PC, so it has to have some RAM because you have to simulate, you have to also you're running an application that needs to use RAM. So how so much of your physical memory is going to be allocated to this virtual memory? So you could see my computer has about 16 gigs of RAM. And so for this Linux server, I'm just, I can give it like, you know, one gig. This is 1024. I can give it less like 512, depending on what it's doing, or I can give it more depending on how much work I think this is doing. For something like a server, um, I'm not doing a whole lot of working. One gig is okay. If you want, you can give it like I say, half a gig, which is 512 or more. If you're going to do a desktop, don't give it anything less than one gig. Maybe uh, for Linux desktop, it can totally work with even 512, but I would suggest you don't go less than one gig. Um, again, it depends on what kind of operating system you install and what you plan to do in that operating system. We're just doing some simple um, thing here. So um, we'll see next in the next set of videos what I'm using this VM for. Um, and so here it's asking me if I should create a hard disk. I get it. Yes, I have a hard disk. So the RAM is phys your physical RAM is going to take some of that to use as RAM. It can't simulate that. But what it's going to do is create a file on your hard drive. And that file is going to be the virtual drive that is going to be mounted in this virtual VM to look like a hard drive. And so the virtual machine uses a hard uh, file to simulate an hard drive, but it actually uses real RAM, which is this is which means that is you can create a hundreds of virtual machines if you like, but only a certain number you can run concurrently or at the same time because each one would take up some physical amount of memory. So in my case, where I have 16 gigs of memory, if you imagine I create um, 10 servers each with one gig. Then I could run those 10 and I'd only leave 16, 6 gigs for my operating system, my uh, Mac OS to do things, which cut down on how much things I could be doing on my Mac and all this other stuff. So basically, your physical memory get divided up when as you run, um, you know, virtual machine. Whereas your hard drive, yes, it can be tied to your physical storage, but there's some nice things that this hard drive gives you. I could create a hard drive, so I'm going to say create here. 
and these are different formats for the hard drive just leave choose the default don't worry about it all works just fine and you can do dynamically allocated or fixed size dynamically allocated if you read it you'll see it all you can specify how the maximum size i can say 20 gigs but it doesn't take up 20 gigs off my hard drive at the same side in, as, um, at one time. It doesn't create a 20 gig hard drive file, 20 gig byte file. Instead, it creates the smallest possible file. And as I put more stuff in this virtual machine, it just grows that um, file. Just like any file where you add data to the file is just growing. Another way to do it is to say fixed size, in which case it actually creates, um, let's say I were to do fixed size, but I didn't. And I say I want a 10 gig hard drive then it would create a 10 gig file on my system with this name. Um, and it, it regards on how much thing, how much um, of that virtual hard drive I actually use, it would still occupy 10 gigs on my file system. But by doing the dynamic one, I say the maximum size is 10 gigs, but when I say create, it's not going to be a 10 gig file because I will not start off by installing so many things that I need to use 10 gigs. So that allows you to save a little bit more space on your computer. And you can always, if you start running out of space, you can like, oh, you can add a physical hard drive to a um, computer. You can just create another file and add it, another virtual disk, so long as you have storage on your host computer and add it to this virtual machine. Like a lot of things that I can't like, explain and show you in this one video. Now, when I finish creating my, um, virtual machine, my VM, I still go to settings to sort of go through and you could click on any one of these. I don't have to actually click on settings. I could just click on one of these highlighted headings here to go to that specific section, but I'll click on settings and you'll see it always the same exact set of headings there. So general system, da 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 da, all the way to user interface and so on. Um, and within each like general, there's the name that we give it. Linux is the type and so on. There's advanced. And you can see whether you want to do a share clipboard and it should allow like drag and drop and so on. You can do a description, whether the disk should be encrypted. So I'll leave those. You go to system and this is again, how much memory or RAM we give to our system, to this virtual machine from the guest, from our physical machine on the host. You can see whether your virtual machine um, is going to use a floppy disk. And no, I don't need a floppy disk. Um, optical disk, which is CD. Yes, that's how I'm going to install the operating system and hard disk, which we created. So that's fine. The chipset, if some of these don't make sense, this is again, the motherboard. So you, your motherboard is going to have all this stuff like whether it support, um, what type of chipset it support and how the, the clock is managed. So we can leave all of that processor type again, not type, sorry, the information about the processor by default, it uses one CPU. But you notice here my host has eight CPUs. So if this server, this VM I'm creating, I want to run a server that is going to be doing a lot of work. Well, I might want to give it more than one CPU. And of course, appropriately size the memory too, depending on what is it that I want to do with that server. So now I'm going to leave it at one CPU because like I say, I'm not doing a whole lot. And this is execution cap. Don't worry about that. Leave that alone. Um, basically, these red and green basically says, you're good within this green zone and you can't go in this red zone. That's not going to work. Um, um, acceleration, um, just leave this as the default. Go to display. Um, notice it gives it the minimum video memory. Again, this is a virtual machine, just like a real physical machine. You have a video card and that video card has some memory on it. Here, the maximum amount of memory you can allocate to the, for video is 128. No matter how many virtual machine you create, you should um, move this up to like the max, especially if you're going to do one with a with graphics, like a desktop or something. So I always set all my VMs to have 128 uh, megabytes of video memory. That's just video memory. Monitor count. Again, you can simulate how many video cards you essentially have. I can go up to two, but um, you know, I always leave this at one. I never had the reason to change it. And these are the things I do not change anything with the acceleration for 3D or video or anything like that. Uh, remote desktop is how you can connect to the server. There's a, yet another way, even if you don't want to do graphical, you can create it, um, connect to it. This is recording if you want to record what's going on in a virtual machine to a file, where to record it and so on. Um, if I want to show somebody like what I'm doing in the VM, but we can be able to see it on a console, so I don't need to, the terminal, so I don't need to record it to this file. Uh, storage. Here we have our hard drive, which we created, and we said it was a 10 gig hard drive. The actual size of it right now is only two megabits. 
And so that's how much it's actually taken up on, on the file system. It's not using up that um, 10 gig, even though that's what I selected, All right? So let me copy this. Maybe I might paste this later. Um, so take a look at it. And it's tell you like, you know, do you want to treat this hard drive like a solid state drive or hot pluggable drive? This is the one that we really care about because we already created a hard drive. We don't care about that anymore. And we want it to connect to a CD-ROM again. We have this thing that simulates a CD-ROM, but it can connect to a physical CD-ROM. So we can use our own CD-ROM. This would be live CD-ROM. So if you have a CD-ROM on your Mac or whatever computer, it can actually read from there. Or you can choose a virtual optical disk. And so that is what we have when we downloaded. Hello. This is what we have when we downloaded our um, Ubuntu installation media was this ISO file. ISO is the format for CD-ROMs. So there's one format, there are others, but ISO is very popular. And so there's our Ubuntu download, you know, 18.4 um, server. And so I select that and now this is pointing to this file. So now I have essentially attached a file, just like how I'm using a file for my hard drive, I'm using, I'm using a file for the CD-ROM also, and that's going to allow me to install my operating system. Sound, I usually leave this. Again, you can get sound because this is a real machine. This is the next important thing, network. So you have four, by default, you have four network adapter that um, you could think of it as four possible Ethernet interfaces for this virtual machine. The other three are usually not configured, but the first one here uses NAT, which means from within that virtual machine, you can get out through the host interface onto the internet and all that stuff, but nothing can come back in because it's on a NAT interface. Now, that's what it's attached to. You can do NAT network, you can do host um, adapter host only, which means you create a network for this virtual machine and the host alone to communicate, it can, in, it can get out. But bridge adapter is the one that I was mentioning. And notice when we say bridge adapter, we have this option here to say, what do we want it to be bridged to? And so on my Mac, I'm using Wi-Fi as a way to connect to the internet. So I want to bridge it over that. If I was using Ethernet or Thunderbolt or anything else, I would choose one of those. But basically, my Ethernet interface is what is giving me my IP address. And by bridging my virtual machine to the same interface, my virtual machine is also going to get an um, IP address that's in the, on the same network as the rest of my house and anything else within my house can access this virtual machine once it starts up and get an IP address. You don't need to really do anything in advance here. Advanced is basically the type of Ethernet interface you want to simulate. Just go with the default unless you have really good reason. Um, later on, as you export and um, import virtual machine, let's say I clone this virtual machine. I don't want to use the same Mac address, especially if I want both of them to be running at the same time, because now I'll have two virtual machines with the same Mac address. So then I would click on this button to change it and it randomly give it something else, but you don't need to do that. And they really, anytime you'd really want to enable the other adapters, but if you need to just click here and choose how to configure them again, um, they're there for you to use if you need it. And for ports, Again, you don't need to do anything here unless you need to simulate the serial ports and all this other stuff, so leave this. Shared folder is how you can click here, add, and you can select a path and a folder on your system, the host system, and you can choose how it's mounted, if it's read-only, read-write. And essentially, within your virtual machine, uh, VirtualBox would take care of mounting a folder that's on your desktop on the host into that virtual machine. So if you actually want to do some work, you can be creating files on your host and it's show up in your guests and vice versa. So we're not going to cover that today. And this is basically the kind of interface you want, but we're going to leave that. The only thing I change is like what I said, showed you is within the system for the RAM, um, the uh, processor, if I need multiple processors, but more time I don't, and my video memory. And then I take off floppy. Again, it's not that important, but we who know about old time computers, they boot up and they start looking for a floppy drive and then there's a boot order and they look for the optical CD-ROM and then if they don't find it, then the hard disk. And that is why when we have our disk, uh, optical CD-ROM configured now, our hard disk doesn't have an operating system on it, it's going to start booting the optical disk, give us the opportunity to install. When we finish installing, we're gonna eject virtually that optical disk and when it restarts, it's going to try and look for the CD-ROM, not find anything, and then it's going to go to the hard drive, find the operating system, and we're good. All right, so enough talking. This this takes, this takes a long time. So now we've configured, we have this 
virtual machine is off, but notice it's pointing to an ISO, right? The optical drive is pointing to an ISO and we have our physical drive. And so we can click start and fail to open a session for this, da da da. It says kernel driver not installed. Okay, so now let's do a reinstall. I'm going to quit this. Um, nothing is running. And let's do a install of VirtualBox again. I've never had this problem with VirtualBox before. Um, never, ever. Just as, I don't know if it's because I'm running Catalina, but I've seen people have this issue with Maverick. So maybe there's something to that. So I'll eject VirtualBox, try and rerun it. And let's see what happens this time. It should still find my old VM and so on there, even though I reinstall it, the configuration is separate. So I'll just click start. This automatic capture keyboard refers to when I move my mouse over this window. Notice because my Linux doesn't have a GUI that uses a mouse, my mouse seems to disappear. That's because, yeah, this operating system doesn't have mouse support. And the automatic capture in is basically because I've moved into over this window, it's now my keyboard inputs. If I type, goes to this virtual machine, my mouse and everything goes to this virtual machine. You can make it so that it doesn't do automatic capturing, but I like automatic capturing. I think it's one of the easiest way to sort of use the VM. So um, probably get, get take some time to get used to. So here's our installation and I click English is what I want to install. And then it's asked me to identify my keyboard that looks correct. So I'll just click done. Well, not click, I just enter. Um, notice how it, the Ethernet interface on this virtual machine, um, the type is Ethernet, the name is ENP0S3. That's from within Linux, that's how it sees it. But notice it got an IP address. The IP address is whatever, my network and 246. That's all I really need to remember. And so I say done, I already did that. I don't need a proxy, so I don't go through a proxy. And if you're alternate mirror for Ubuntu enter details here, I'll just enter done. Um, I think I skipped a thing there just now, but it now it's giving me the virtual hard drive. Remember we created a 10 gig virtual hard drive. This is what it is. And so I'm going to not worry about partitioning and just enter that is the drive I want to use. And I'll just say done to let it go through and create the default partitions that you see there. It creates a one meg boot partition or a smart partition with a BIOS and then in 9.9 .9 gig a partition that's going to format as slash as forward slash. If you don't know anything about how Unix will operate, don't worry, just accept these and just click done again. Um, so are you sure you want to continue? So I use my down arrow, select continue and I press enter. Here, this is going to be doing the installation in the background while we fill out a form for the first user that we want for our system. By default, all Unix systems just always have the root user account. That's more for administration, so you shouldn't use that. You should create a non-root user account that allows you to do login and day-to-day -day things. And you can also do something called su sudo, which allows you to assume um, or run commands as the sudo user. So um, that's going to be configured for you by Ubuntu by default to do sudo, and they generally disable. Oh, and it actually mentions all that in the very top over there. So um, let's say I want to create an account called Veril. Um, so that's my name. I got to press back my keyboard. Um, let's see, delete, 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 delete. So my username is Veril and Adams. And then if I press next was my computer name or the host name for the server. Let's call it, um, let's call it Linux server, I guess. Linux dash server zero. Let's just call it that. That works. I don't know. And to, to, to enter, I'm going to go to pick a username. So the top is my full name. Um, you could think of it as your display name. And your username, I'm just going to use the username 
be viral within this machine. Now, my it doesn't matter what my host username is versus my guest username. I can use the same username in all my guests, right? Because they're all separate machines, you could think of it. And then password. I'll give it a password. Since it's just a virtual machine running on my laptop, and even though it's exposed on my network, I don't keep it on all the time, all that stuff. You could create a decent password, but it doesn't have to be ultra secure. Again, if you're going to set up a VM and you're going to have it running all the time and provide services that you might um, expose via your router, then you should totally use a very secure password. But here I'm going to use a very simple password. I assume I type it correctly both times. So I press done. And so I'm going to install OpenSSH server. I want to install OpenSSH. Can remember, I'm going to, even though I can use the console because this is run on my laptop, I can just use the console to log in and do everything I want. I also want to access it over the network so I can log in over the network. <laughs> it's sad or weird that I'm going to log in over the network to something that's running on my laptop. But that's what I want to be able to treat it like if it's a physical machine on my network and not think too much of the fact that it's actually running on my laptop. And so I do have a user interface. So yes, I want to install OpenSSH server. And so I'll just tap down. I don't have any identity key that I can import. I do, but I don't, I'm not going to worry about it. I'll show you another way of installing your key. And so I'll click done. And then these are other things that I can install, like the micro keys that I mentioned, and you could go through the list of Docker and a whole bunch of other things. Like you can imagine, this is a server, so there are a number of things here you can install. I'm not gonna install anything more. If I want something else later, I can install it. I'll click done, and it's done installing OpenSSH, and it says it's 11 of 13. If you were watching the bottom of the screen, you'll see it all as we were going through, it was changing like one of 13, blah, 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 and as we did more and more stuff, it um, so it's here it's saying cancel update and reboot um, we can do this right now if you notice at the bottom of the screen there is doing downloading and installing security updates and it's saying that oh hey we can just cancel doing the update now and just let you reboot um, start using your OS and then maybe we'll do update and um, update the security setting um, packages the update the packages that were changed for security reasons um, that might have new security updates later um, that's one way to go. Um, so let's, instead of waiting, let's just enter cancel and then um, let's do tab, um, let's do close. And it says rebooting down on the bottom there. Now what's gonna happen is because uh, we're doing, uh, we're using this virtual machine and we're sort of connected or link our virtual CD-ROM to this virtual disk, it's still connected. So when we reboot, there's a good chance it's gonna come back to the installation menu because that's the first thing our boot order is CD-ROM then hard drive. So if it still sees that the CD-ROM is linked, it's just gonna naturally try and boot it. The computer doesn't know that we already have an operating system installed unless it you know, tried to move access the hard drive first and then didn't see anything, then it could have failed and go to the CD-ROM. But that's the way we have it now is to do CD-ROM first. So while this is canceling, updating, and waiting to reboot, um, I'll wait for it. And I'm just giving you the heads up that it might try to reinstall again, but we'll just power it off if we see that's the case. Then we will say, tell it to eject that virtual CD and then reboot it. And, thing. and you can see there are some, icon, some icons at the bottom here. This is the hard drive. So let's show you activity to our hard drive. They show you activity to our CD-ROM or virtual CD-ROM, speaker and the network, network activity mouse and so on um, and if we want we can click here on the cd-rom and we can see, as you can see it's still linked to this virtual drive and we can click like remove from virtual disk um, and we'll do that when we finally cancel this reboot i think this um 184 is sort of i've never had it wait this long to cancel an update and reboot so uh, i'm not sure why it's taking so long um but it looks like there's some disk activity, so it looks like it is doing some stuff. So I don't want to like terminate it. But I think our installation of the OS is already complete and already secure if it was trying to do just an update. So um, I think it's fine to just terminate it. So we can do that in several ways. We can do this, 
I close this and you can see it says save machine state, send a shutdown signal or just power out the machine. This is equivalent to just turning off the power, just pulling the plug or pressing the power off, power off button. So we'll do that. And so notice it's off. Now that it's off, I want to remove this ISO image. So I'll go back to storage here and I'll select this and then I'll click here and I'll say remove virtual disk and notice now it's empty. So this is equivalent to me popping out that CD-ROM. I'll say OK or save changes and then I'll try and load now. Remember we have a virtual CD-ROM and a hard drive disk. There's nothing in the CD-ROM so it's going to skip that and it's going to go straight to loading Linux operating system which you see it's what it's doing in the background there. And so it's booting up so that tells us that oh, we successfully installed Linux at least. Well at least from so far it's booting, everything is okay. It's starting up some services. Um, the more times you, you see this, eventually the stuff that's run by the screen there sort of makes sense. And now we could log in. So we could log in with my, so it's still loading up some stuff. Um, you know, let's just do that so we can enter a few times. We still have the login screen, just some things that were still running and they spit out some garbage on the screen. But if we do viral, that was the username I created with a password, if I could remember the password. Uh, what did I do? Uh, I think that's the wrong password. Um, just give me one more option. Let's see, Vero. And um, that should be my correct password. And yep, there you go. I'm, I'm, I installed it. I, I logged in. And it's give, telling me I thought there's some 58 packages that are out of date and nine packages for security updates. So this is one of the things you can do. And you can do sudo apt update to say sort of go check for new packages. It already told us above there, but I'm just showing you one way you can do it. And again, I type my password. And it just have access to the internet, right? It goes out to the internet and then I can do upgrade minus Y for upgrade. Why minus Y? Because it's going to prompt me if I want to upgrade anyway. And so um, sudo app upgrade minus Y. And upgrade minus Y. And so, oh. uh, yeah, we have some configuration problem. We didn't finish. So let me do sudo dpkg minus minus configure. So this means minus a configure only all the packages that are not fit completely configured. And so, doo -doo -doo -doo, so lib NS system and stuff, um, they weren't installed apparently. So let's see. Lib system D is not installed. Okay, so we can do sudo um, app um, install minus F, I think. And so that says basically force install. Yes. Install all the stuff that's missing. So do, do, do. And da, da, da. Oh, no, that happened that oh, it wasn't installed, but oh well. So now it looked like we we're fully installed. And so now we can go back to upgrade and yep. So now we're going to update those packages. So just in case, um, I've never had that problem before, but I sort of know, um, because you use Ubuntu for a long time that oh, if you need to install something that's missing, you can do install minus F to say force install. Um, I don't know why minus A didn't work, but um, that's more like a Debian thing, the configure minus A to configure packages, and minus A is like all packages that need configuration, basically. Um, <laughs> this is a lot, much longer video than I thought it would be, but we did two things really. We installed VirtualBox, and along the way, I talked a whole lot about VirtualBox, so Hopefully, if this what you were new to VirtualBox, you sort of got some insight into it. And then when I was creating the VM, I talked a whole lot about that. And so the installation of Linux itself and specifically Ubuntu, what didn't take that long. That was all about five minutes, if you look at it. All the other time was spent really installing VirtualBox and trying to get over the hump of when I tried to start up VirtualBox, it had at least permission issue, which was is specifically to Mac only. So you should not run into those issues if you're using a lot of operating system. So now we have this all set up and upgraded, updated. We can we should reboot it so it runs with the latest configuration. So I'll do sudo reboot and you know it's gonna reboot my virtual machine and you can see that oh the console here went better and it's coming back up. Now I forgot what a password what a IP address that we got here. I think it was um 246 and so I can do various do ping um, 10 that 10 that 100 is my network 246 and so it looks like it's up and so all right so let's move this to the side I can close this it doesn't stop my virtual machine from running 
So here's my virtual machine. Again, I could log in at the console there, or I could log in from the network here. So I can do SSH. And so the way I copy my key into this machine, so okay, let me do it two things. I can do SSH veral at 10.10.100.246. And then it says, oh, I don't know who you are. And then my password. And there you go. I'm in this virtual machine. Remember I call it Linux Server 1. We did all those updates, so we have nothing to update. My directory is clean. I can do df minus h, and I can see that I am running on a, you know, my 10 gig file system, which remember we were mounted a slash. Well, of that, I'm using 3.4 gig, 3.9 gigs, 5.45 gigs is free. So we're not using a full 10 gigs yet, right? We can still install a bunch of crap. Um, and then I can exit. But notice, I don't want to keep typing a password every time I go to log into this thing. So I've created a key, and you can do create a key by doing SSH key gen, and just press an enter and follow the prompt, create a key. Once you have a key created, I can do SSH dash copy, and I want to copy it, this key to 10.10.100.246. And now I type my password, right? Because I want to copy the key there. And so once I do this once, now, when I ready to SSH in, because my key is there, oh boy, I shouldn't have to type a password. Just defeats the whole problem. Purpose. So it says that all my keys install. <laughs> um, let's see. I copy it to virl at 10 at 10 at 100. Yeah. And it said it was copied successfully. Notice how I, I log in without having to type a password. And so that's a nice way to call password less login. We're going to see more of it when we do um, or microservices and all this other stuff and Docker container and so on. But just to give you a heads up. So <laughs> that's it. Um, take care. Bye. See you in the next video. Definitely let me know if you have problems.